I'm going to ask that you please stand for the national anthem. of the Ambassador of the Republic of China on Taiwan, Sir Probin Innes, former Governor of St. Kitts and Nevis, and President of the Brimstone Hill National Park Society and Lady Innes, Mr. Michael Morton, Vice President of the Brimstone Hill National Park Society, Mr. Larry Armini, Coordinator of the History and Heritage Committee and other members of the committee, members of the UWI Open Campus Student Guild, Special awardee, Mr. Kenneth Samuel. Staff, students, alumni, and friends, good evening. Good evening. I do apologize for the slightly delayed start, and I thank you all for braving what we in Sinkis would call inclement weather, <laughs> and others might call a nice, cool, tropical evening. So thank you all very much for joining us here this evening. Each year, the UWI participates in the History and Heritage Month of activities by serving on the planning committee and hosting a public lecture. This is now the 11th year of the History and Heritage Committee, um, the History and Heritage Month of activities, and Mr. Amelie will speak in more detail about the actual month of activities, but it has been my pleasure over the last, I think, six years, this is my sixth History and Heritage Month of activities, to see the month of activities really grow from a week to a month, but if you look at the calendar of events, you'll see that we've outgrown the month, and it's now perhaps closer to a month and a half, so congratulations to all members of the committee, and thank you all for your continued support of the activities. This year, it is our distinct pleasure and honor to welcome His Excellency Sir Taffy Seaton to deliver a keynote address as one of the first activities in this year's History and Heritage calendar. I must note, of course, that Sir Tapley also graciously agreed to deliver a keynote address in Nevis, which he delivered as part of the History and Heritage Month of Activities on Tuesday. And I understand it was well attended, the dialogue was very engaging, and I don't doubt we'll have similarly engaging dialogue here tonight. This evening, His Excellency will deliver an address on the theme, Strengthening Our Commitment to Preserving Our Heritage, Our Arts, archives and marine environment. And I see in our audience people who are deeply invested in each of the elements of our theme tonight. So I know that we will be very engaged in the discussion as the evening proceeds. The UWI Open Campus takes great pleasure in providing a platform for discussions on important themes and topics, such as the one in which we'll be engaged this evening. 
It is important as educational institutions, and I see my colleagues from CFBC here, good evening Mr. Hadiga, <laughs> that we embrace the responsibility we have to develop and encourage discourse within and outside of the classroom. The UWI offers programs of study at various levels in history, heritage, art, records management, and maritime environment. We are also engaged in community-based projects throughout the region that provide tools through which our citizens and residents can gain skills to preserve and convey the stories of the region. Just this week, I had the pleasure of watching a live stream of a graduation ceremony for the Caribbean Film Project in Jamaica, and this is a, an eight-week training program that is made available for, to young people throughout various communities in Jamaica, Kingston and Montego Bay and so on. And I'm saying with excitement that we are now working on an initiative to launch a similar project in St. Kitts and Nevis, so a Caribbean film project in St. Kitts and Nevis, and I'm hoping that in the not too distant future I'll be able to welcome you to film screenings here at perhaps the open campus, perhaps Caribbean cinemas, we're not sure how it will all progress, but I'm looking forward to seeing all of you as we move through that um, journey as well. I'll not spend too long expressing my welcome, as like you, I'm eager to hear more about the History and Heritage Month of activities, more about the special award, and most eagerly await the keynote address by His Excellency Sir Tapley Seaton. I normally end my welcome to this event with a poem. Mr. Amni once said that hopefully one day I'll share a poem of my own, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> but I, I do love literature, I love poetry, so I take opportunities when I can to share a little bit of the work that I love of others. But tonight I want to share a quote from a cultural theorist whose work I really respect. Um, his name is Stuart Hall, and I'm sure that most of you, many of you are, are quite familiar with his work. As a former student of Caribbean literature and film, I'm always interested in concepts of identity and recognize the emergence of varied definitions of identity in the discussion period which follows most of the public lectures and film screenings hosted right here at the UWI Open Campus. Stuart Hall offers a varied interpretation of cultural identity in the context of history and heritage. While I don't expect us all to agree with this definition, I find it interesting to ponder in relation to this year's theme. A couple of you might be familiar with it because I like to share it um, via photocopies or via um, web links quite often. But this is a quote that, that I find interesting to ponder. Cultural identity, in this second sense, is a matter of becoming as well as of being. It belongs to the future as much as to the past. It is not something which already exists, transcending place, time, history, and culture. Cultural identities come from somewhere, have histories, but like everything which is historical, they undergo constant transformation. Far from being eternally fixed in some essentialized past, they are subject to the continuous play of history, culture, and power. Far from being grounded, in a mere recovery of the past, which is awaiting to be found, and which, when found, will secure our sense of ourselves into eternity. Identities are the names we give to the different ways we are positioned by and position ourselves within the narratives of the past. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that we are in for fruitful discussion this evening. I know that we are going to be really stimulated by the presentation by his Excellency, the Governor General, and I will now hand over to Mr. Larry Armany, coordinator of the History and Heritage Month of Activities, who will offer some brief remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Susan Cohen, Your Excellency, Sir Tapley Seaton, Governor General, Mr. Proben Innes, former Governor General of St. Kitts and Nevis, Mr. Eugene Hamilton, uh, Honorable Minister of Agriculture and others in St. Kitts and Nevis. Sometimes I'm not sure whether I should append Nevis <laughs> to these designations. <laughs> um, and Lady Innes, sorry, I, did, I, 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 I you know, um, did not mention you. Um, 
other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On the 3rd of September 2005, Sir Proben President of the Brimson Hill Fortress National Park Society, convened a meeting at which some members of staff of the society and other invited persons, cultural activists, educators were present. He was concerned that it seemed to him that there was a lack of knowledge and understanding and appreciation of the history and culture of our country amongst many people, among citizens, particularly amongst young people. And he felt he wanted to do something about it. And from his position as president of a non-governmental NGO organization, which had a mission really of protecting and preserving an aspect of our, of our heritage, an organization which over the years had been able to generate um, some surpluses from its operations. And because it's non-profit, therefore, there was something that it had to give back to the community. He thought of a history of heritage week. So he convened this meeting, and in, present at this meeting were um, himself, Sir Proben Ennis, as, 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 as chair, myself, I was the general manager at the time, Gregory Pereira, a long-standing member of the society, the Brimstone Society, Anthony Wiltshire, an educator, um, he's also a member of the Brimstone Hill Society, Lyndon Williams and uh, Jacqueline Harmony of the St. Christopher Heritage Society, as it was at the time, Crichton Pension and Marlene Phillips of the Department of Culture, and Sheila Morris of the Clarence Fitzroy Rand College. And this meeting unanimously decided to organize a history and heritage week. And the third week in February was selected because it was felt that given the school calendar, very loaded calendar for the schools, and the fact that our, one of our major target audiences for students, that this was the best time. That is why the third week of February was selected. And the History and Heritage Week of Activities, and I'm quoting from a newsletter of the Brimson Hill Society. Um, it's a very important document, you know, these newsletters, the series of newsletters recount the story of the organization. <coughs> And the history, the first History and Heritage Week of Activities was launched by the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Denzel Douglas, during a radio and television broadcast in ZNSN um, on the evening of Sunday the 19th. Since then, the History and Heritage Week has attracted other partners, um, including the New Historical and Conservation Society, which now manages and organizes its own activities in Nevis, but in collaboration to an extent. They're members of the History and Heritage Committee. And other partners, um, the Public Library, the C. Chalmers Public Library, um, the, the Clarence Fitzroy Bryant um, Culture Club, um, the National Archives, um, the Departments of Education and Culture in St. Kitts, um, and others. And, uh, this acti these series of activities, um, there's some core activities. We have, every year, we have a primary schools quiz, uh, which is a major feature of the History and Heritage Month. We have a senior citizens social evening, when a hundred or so seniors from around the island gather together and entertain themselves and other guests, and we count uh, reminisce on the past and so on and sing songs and that kind of thing. So we have here the very young and we have the very old. The problem really has been to reach you know, those persons who are considered the youth, young people. It has been a problem. This year we are looking forward to having um, an activity that is generated by young people, but more about that. So the week of activities has grown to a month of activities. And as I mentioned, one of our partners, and indeed Susan 
I've mentioned it, so we know and mention it as well, is the University of the West Indies. First of all, you were continuing school of education, and then you became the university on campus. So every year, for the past several years, after the very outset, yes, at the very outset, the University of the West Indies became involved and uh, facilitated um, public lectures by scholars, um, mainly from the University of the West Indies. So they work in partnership with the History and Heritage Committee to present a lecture, hence the lecture tonight. Another thing that um, we have done, but intermittently over the years, was to select someone who we consider to have made an outstanding contribution to the promotion, the protection, the preservation of the culture, the heritage, the history of the country. And we have made a number of selections in the past. This year, given the theme, strengthening our commitment to preserving our heritage, colon, our arts, archives, and marine environment, and if this seems to you to be a, a very disparate bag of, um, of, of um, you know, elements um, that comprise our history and heritage, um, then I think that by the end of tonight's presentation by His Excellency, you'll see how neatly they are connected and how they interface and interact with each other. So given that theme, um, the History and Heritage Committee have identified an iconic figure for presenting the award. And I will just now read the citation. Kenneth Samuel, he is, grew up along or in proximity to the Newtown Bay Road, and from the age of 10 years or so, was educated along the beach, in the waters, out at sea, spear fishing, diving for conks and lobsters, to help support the household of his mother and her two sons, including a younger brother. Informally apprenticed to fishermen, he learned to make fish pots, mend nets, and handle boats. Sometime in the mid-1960s, some visitors to the island engaged him to take them to a location offshore to dive. They went down to about 60 feet, equipped with scuba tanks and other gear, that is, the visitors, he went with them, equipped with a homemade mask, coming up for air every now and again, and then going back down. One of them left a tank and some gear. Ken learned to use them. About 20 years later, this benefactor returned and arranged for Ken to become professionally trained. He became certified in 1985 and has been teaching scuba diving and leading diving expeditions ever since. He has given introductory courses to perhaps thousands of divers, some 35 per week during the mid-1980s and 1990s, including about two dozen locals. He does not discriminate against locals. It's just that there's not much interest. Ken Samuels intimately knows the offshore waters of our islands, particularly St. Kitts, from the surface to the seabed. He has seen the changes wrought by man and by nature and grieves that the most destructive changes are man-made and could have been avoided. Over the years, he has been and continues to be a passionate advocate for the protection of our underwater marine environment as well as the artifacts that abound on the seabed, talking to all kinds of people, including government technocrats, and government ministers, but to little or no avail. They listen, but do not act. He has tried to enlist the support of other stakeholders who derive benefits and livelihoods from our vulnerable marine resources, but they shy away from signing petitions. He has continually tried to engage young people so that locals could succeed him in a potentially lucrative profession which is dominated in other Caribbean islands by expatriates, and thereby for these locals to see the need for protection and therefore become advocates like he. 
Kenneth Samuel has received many trophies and plaques of commendation. He just checked his dive center on the Newton Bay Road. He himself hardly needs recognition, but his cause, his mission, is in urgent need of support. Before we lose much more of that precious resource, the nursery of our initial fish and crustaceans, that valuable attribute of a tourism product, our marine resources. That is why we present another award so that perhaps other people may understand the imperative of action now. And <clears throat> His Excellency has graciously consented on behalf of the Eastern Heritage Committee to present a plaque to Kenneth Sam. Congratulations once again, Mr. Samuel, on that well-deserved award. I think we could give him another round of applause, right? <laughs> and perhaps a few of us who are not certified divers and have never tried it might consider now visiting Kent's Dive Center and um, perhaps taking a, maybe a snorkel, if not a dive. <laughs> it now gives me great pleasure to welcome to the podium Miss Carissa Roberts of the UWI Open Campus, St. Kitts and Nevis, student guild chapter and this is a newly formed guild chapter and they have been extremely supportive of all uwi open campus activities thus far and we are equally supportive of all of the student activities so i ask you to please join me in welcoming her to the podium to introduce our featured speaker this evening Sir Tapley, Weymouth, Seaton, GCMG, CVO, QC, JP, LLB, with honors from the UWI, attorney at law and notary public. He was educated at the Epworth Junior School, now the Morris Hillier Memorial Junior School, the St. Kitts and Nevis Grammar School, the Bastia High School, the University of the West Indies, the Council of Legal Education of the West Indies and the Ottawa University. He obtained modern languages, French and Spanish at advanced level with distinction. He taught for one year from 1969 to 1970 at the Bastia High School. Subjects included Spanish, French and Latin forms 1A to 1B. He attended the University of the West Indies Cave Hill Barbados graduating in 1973 with the Bachelor of Laws LLB degree with upper second class honors. In 1975, he received the Legal Education Certificate from the Council of Legal Education of the West Indies, having attended year one at the Hugh Wooding Law School and year two at the Norman Manley Law School. While in year one, he was a tutor in criminal law for year one faculty of law students at the St. Augustine Campus Trinidad. He has had a number of firsts in his career. He became the first Attorney General of an independent federation of St. Kitts and Nevis on the 19th of September 1983 
having earlier served as Crown Counsel and Acting Registrar and Magistrate. Upon assuming the post of Attorney General in 1980, pre-independence, at age 29, he was the youngest Attorney General in the Commonwealth and he served in that post for 15 years, becoming the longest serving Attorney General in the region. He was among the first group of graduates of the Faculty of Law of the University of the West Indies in 1973 and of the Council of Legal Education of the West Indies in 1975 and the first of those graduating to be appointed as Attorney General in 1980 and the first to be elevated to the rank of Silk as one of Her Majesty's Council in 1988. Mr. Seaton has also served as President of the St. Kitts and Nevis Bar Association and is a past President of the Rotary Club of St. Kitts. He was a director of the St. Kitts and Nevis Chamber of Industry and Commerce from 1999 to 2006 and is the immediate past president of the OECS Bar Association. He is also an immediate past president and vice president of the St. Christopher National Trust and vice president of the Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park Society and served as chairman of the UWI Territorial Advisory Committee for over 25 years. He is a trained legislative drafter from the University of Ottawa and he and has been an attorney at law for the past 38 years and he was a senior partner in the law firm Seaton and Foreman. He has served in several capacities over the years. While at university he was a member of the Cave Hill Students Guild Council. He was the first former student to serve on the Council of Legal Education. He was among the longest serving and received several awards. First Chairman 1985 to 1995 of the Joint Venture Telecommunications Company Cable and Wireless, now a public company. Former Chairman of the Frigate Bay Development Corporation. Former President of the St. Christopher Heritage Society. Former Member of the Board of Governors of the Clarence Fitzroy Bryant College. While Attorney General, he co-authored several significant pieces of landmark legislation, including the National Environmental and Conservation Protection Act 1987, the Protection of Employment Act 1986, and the Cooperative Societies Act. Since the meeting office, he was a member of the drafting team at the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, which drafted the Securities Act 2000, Securities Regulation and Amendments to the Alien Land Holding Legislation of all Member Territories of the ECCB. He has drafted on a pro bono basis the following legislations. One for the Chamber of Industry and Commerce, Small and Medium Scale Enterprise Program under an ILO sponsored project. Two, for the Ministry of Education, the legislative framework to facilitate greater autonomy for the Clarence Fitzroy Bryant College, three, for the St. Christopher Heritage Society, the National Trust Act. He is presently undertaking research with a view to publishing a layman's guide to the constitution of St. Kitts and Nevis, bearing in mind its quasi-federal uniqueness. He has also received a number of awards. In 1980, he was appointed a Justice of Peace, JP. In 1985, awarded the rank of Commander of the Royal Victorian Order, CVO, by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II during a royal visit to St. Kitts and Nevis. In 1988, he was elevated to the rank of Silk, one of Her Majesty's Council, Queen's Council, and was the first graduate of the West Indian Law Schools to be so elevated. In 2015, he was awarded the conferral of the accolade Knight Grand Cross of the Most Distinguished Order of St. Michael and St. George, GCMG. He was also appointed a notary public of St. Kitts and Nevis. On the 12th of May 2015, he was appointed Governor General's Deputy of St. Christopher and Nevis. On the 14th of May 2015, 
He was appointed acting Governor General of St. Christopher and Nevis. And on the 1st of September 2015, he was appointed Governor General of St. Christopher and Nevis. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. S. W. Tapley Seton. Good evening. Um, I'm, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, some of the elements of it I'm just now being brought to my recollection <laughs> once again. And some aspects of it, of course, um, have been added to in terms of it now being my 40th year instead of my 38th year as a lawyer. I am tempted somewhat to utilize this occasion to adopt the expression of saying, adopted the established protocol, which is so often done, and, and my asset is then sought to be able to do it. So tonight I give myself permission <laughs> <laughs> to adopt the protocol, but nevertheless to recognize certain persons who are here. I'm very pleased to see the Honorable Eugene Hamilton here, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, human settlement, etc., health, etc., etc. Okay, um, Minister, thank you for coming and gracing us with your presence. I'm also very happy to see Sapobin and Lady Ines. Um, I'll say more about Sapobin during the course of my presentation. And of course, I should say then, friends all, um, thank you very much for coming out to lend support to this activity. And of course, I take the opportunity while I'm at the microphone, to congratulate Mr. Kenneth Samuel on a well-deserved award in this very important year. <laughs> Madam Chair, I wish to thank the organizers of the Commemoration of History and Heritage Month 2015 for inviting me to speak to you on this year's theme, strengthening our commitment to preserving our heritage, our arts, archives, and the marine environment. I consider it a great honor to have been so invited, especially as this year marks the 11th anniversary of this celebration. History and heritage are important and significant elements in our respective lives, and I trust that my reflections tonight will highlight the many positive strides that have been taken, some of our short shortcomings, and the way forward as we seek to strengthen our commitment. I wish first of all, though, to recognize the partnership that brings us together every year. The Brimston Hill Fortress National Park Society, which last year celebrated its 50th anniversary from its founding in 1965. A society which evolved over the years from its initial purpose to restore and preserve the historic Brimston Hill Fortress, the Gibraltar of the West Indies, to being recognized by UNESCO as a world heritage site, a place of universal value, and to receive this, the highest accolade in conservation and restoration. We recall with respect and acclaim all of the several presidents, Mr. D. Lloyd Matheson, CBE, foremost among them, and the current president, Sir Pobin Innes, an acclaimed historian and public servant who has contributed immensely to the ongoing work in history and heritage. I will return again to Sir Pobin's contribution as we treat this topic. In Nevis, which I had the pleasure and privilege of addressing two nights ago, the Nevis Historical and Conservation Society, founded in 1980, led the way in terms of the establishment of a group, as it's stated on its website, to conserve the natural, cultural, and historic fabric of the island of Nevis and her surrounding sea. Acknowledged as the inspiration of the society is one of the icons of Nevis, Mr. Arthur Evelyn, who suggested that Nevis needed a group to watch over its historical sites. The society, a non-profit organization whose sources of income include endowments and pledges, 
admission fees, donations, grants, museum shop sales, and fundraising events, membership fees, and a small subvention from the Nevis Island Administration. As in all of these non-governmental organizations, volunteers are key to all of their efforts. And the Society administers two museums, the Alexander Hamilton Museum and the Museum of Nevis History. In 2012, the Nevis Island Assembly enacted an ordinance to establish the Nevis Historical and Conservation Trust. In its then legislative form, the enactment by virtue of its stated board membership would have deprived the trust of a non-governmental status, which is essential to all trusts, whether of local, regional, or international standing. Discussions are required, therefore, to ensure that any proposed trust would have a non-governmental status to enable the society to take this very necessary upwards issue. This was one of the issues that was discussed at the Nevis presentation, that they are concerned and they are committed to taking the necessary steps to ensure that they have in place a trust that can meet that non-governmental objective. And so um, they can look to the St. Christopher Heritage Society and its evolution into the National Trust to see exactly how the composition of the board would facilitate this. We had one of the ministers in the Nevis Island Administration present at the lecture, and there were some undertakings in terms of carrying the matter forward. So I'm pleased to see that as the next step. The Nevis Historical and Conservation Society must be commended for its pioneering activity and its continued promotion of many innovative programs that are progressive. The society was fortunate to have had the support of many non-nationals who had come to regard Nevis as home and who contributed meaningfully to the society's development. Today, many other divisions have come forward to lead this worthy organization, and we certainly wish it well. The St. Christopher Heritage Society emerged as a registered private company with a diverse membership. One of the early activists for society was Sir Innes, whose role was pivotal in the formulation of the concept. The torch was taken up by Jackie Armady and Larry Armady, who together